Todas las personas aquí en Santa María no entendíamos mucho del programa. Empezamos a ver cómo empezaron a traer grupos de personas, de hombres más que nada, a trabajar a los campos agrícolas con la idea de que no había suficiente mano de obra para que levantaran las cosechas. Empezamos a ver cómo ocuparon casas de renta, apartamentos. En los últimos años nos hemos enterado que también ya se construyen o compañías construyen apartamentos especiales para traerlos a ellos y hemos visto un crecimiento de miles y miles más cada año. A lot of people think that H2A workers are just normal local farm workers, and that means that local farm workers are being offered free housing by their employer, which is not the case. In general, like that, cre that adds on to the anti-immigrant rhetoric that we see all the time in terms of thinking that farm workers get paid way too much for their jobs, that they get free housing, and that they don't pay any taxes and are living off the government. The reason that the federal program exists is, is to supplement worker shortage. But I think one of the things that we're finding, especially in Santa Maria, is that there, you know, I can't say that there isn't a worker shortage, but I can say that there are workers who want to be paid better. And a lot of times that's the reason they leave their job. Al principio yo escuchaba que no los querían. O sea, el trabajador local hablaba mal de ellos porque decía es que les están dando viviendas, es que les están dando esto, nosotros no podemos con la renta. Pero ya ahorita también ya se dan cuenta de los abusos que hay en contra del H2A, de todas las injusticias, que el local está un poco más despierto, sabe más de dónde acudir, sabe un poquito más de sus derechos. Ahorita ya sienten más compasión por ellos. H2A workers in many ways are, are more at risk or more vulnerable than undocumented workers. 
if you're an undocumented farm worker and you're being abused or you know they're cheating you out of your pay you just can quit and go work for another employer h2a workers are here on a visa that only applies to that employer and the employer says when the work is done and so H2A workers, that's why they like them so much. They're so compliant. You know, if they complain, they're, you know, the employer just says, your, your job is over, you're going back home. And all the agencies of the U.S. government are committed to sending you back. You know, in the H2A program, we've seen really rampant labor violations. There was a NBC uh, report that came out that found that in 2019 there were 12,000 violations in the H-2A program, which was a 150% increase from just five years before. So, you know, because of the vulnerability of H-2A workers, because of the power imbalance that's set up, it really creates that dynamic where, where maybe not all employers, but some employers are going to be able to take advantage of workers. By federal regulations, they need to have 50 square feet of space for sleeping. The prison requirement is 70 to 80 feet, square feet. So often, you know, H2A workers are really kind of crammed in bunk housing. Uh, you know, we've seen huge outbreaks in many of the H2A labor camps in the Central Coast during, during the COVID-19 pandemic because of that concrete housing. The federal standards are, you know, 10 workers to a shower head, 10 workers to a toilet. Uh, you know, so this is, it is really substandard housing, even though, uh, you know, it's, it's technically kind of meeting the federal guidelines. Nos han platicado cómo se han lastimado, cómo sí parece que empiezan el proceso de una manera donde los mandan con el médico a la aseguranza, donde la mayoría de las veces les dicen no tienes nada, le receta una simple pastilla de libre venta, los muchachos están lastimados y los sacan o los invitan a que se salgan para su país a curarse por ellos mismos, atenderse por ellos mismos y ya el contratista o la compañía se libera de lo que es la compensación al trabajador, pagar la operación si la necesitan y todo lo que va de antemano con una lastimadura de trabajo donde es obligación de la compañía hacerse cargo. There's kind of two, three main types of H-2A housing we mostly see. One, probably the most common is, you know, buying up or renting kind of motels, like cheap motels, you know, you'll see it along Broadway and Santa Maria. The other is buying large houses and, you know, often kind of packing like 20 workers in, in one, one big house. And then the third is the labor camps kind of outside, outside of the city. And those are often much bigger, you know, have, have a lot of workers all bunked in one area. And these are the, the ones that we worry about the most. This is, you know, 3,600 workers that they're expecting to put here. That's more than one in every 10 farm workers right now in Santa Barbara County. You know, it would be, you know, half the size of Guadalupe, which is like a town right next to, to Santa Maria. So it's, you know, it's almost like its own town that's, that would be built, that would be entirely kind of self-contained. When, when we've had kind of, you know, people in Santa Maria, you know, uh, kind of anti-immigrant or anti-farm worker people who've said, we don't want these farm workers living in our residential neighborhoods. Now this developer is proposing, well, let's put this farm worker, these farm workers in an industrial area. This is an area not zoned for homes. And it's not zoned for homes because of the fact that it's, it's zoned for things that are, that are toxic and dangerous to people, like chemical plants or oil refineries. And, you know, we have zoning laws that say, you know, we don't want to put people living next to these kind of toxic things. It can be bad for their health, it can be dangerous to them. And we're not giving that same consideration to farm workers. If anything, we're, this project would be treating farm workers like toxic waste, treating farm workers like something that nobody wants in their, in their neighborhood, so let's push it out to the edge of the city. They will be far removed from the community. And if there's any, you know, issues in that industrial area, they will be affected by it. They will be living in that area. We won't be able to accidentally knock on a door of an H-2A worker house and talk to them about their rights. Imagine being a farm worker, making reasonable demands to get paid better, to be offered first aid if you get a cut, to be offered sick time if you're sick, 
And then literally seeing the city approve this giant housing complex, that's not for you when you already live in crowded conditions with three other families sharing a four bedroom apartment. You're seeing this place being built and then you are seeing workers coming in. The threat that the threat of losing your job is a reality now because you can see that they approve this housing. Uh, maybe that can snowball to other housing being built for H2A workers. And that means that it, it, I think it solidifies that to farm workers that they are disposable, not only to companies, but to our local government. You know, something else I would say is, is no coincidence is that Dan Blau is the same person who developed the ICE facility in Santa Maria that folks really fought against. And, and I think it's, it's no surprise, you know, that the same developers who are, you know, behind this, this shift to the HOE program are also connected with, with ICE and, and, you know, connected with wanting more immigration enforcement um, because ultimately the ag industry you know, depends on immigrant workers, right? And so if they're gonna crack down on folks who are undocumented and, you know, put more and more fear into undocumented farm workers, then they have to have an alternative. And so their alternative has been, you know, let's bring H2A workers. We no longer have to have workers who are here long-term and are starting families and are part of our community. We can just have people who are out of sight, out of mind. We can bring them for a season and we can send them back afterwards. And that's really been the mentality. And that's been, you know, in our immigration system, you know, dating back even before, you know, Mexican workers were the majority of farm workers, even back to like the Chinese Exclusion Act and, you know, and Chinese and Japanese workers were farm workers. That's always what, um, you know, people have wanted uh, in ag industry, in government, of, of the ability to have a super exploitable workforce that can, you know, come in, uh, you know, just for a season, harvest the crop, and then be sent back afterwards and not ever be part of the community. If he's gone, like they possibly could try and still reignite or you think that it's over most likely. Yeah, I don't I don't see why they would want to move forward considering they hadn't moved forward for the last few months. I think it I I really think that because there was so much public attention and people, you know, gave in their opinion and sent in comments that it slowed down the project a lot to the point where there was nothing really happening, right? And, and the major thing that I think helped us was that the public opinion made the project or like the proposal itself change, right? Where the proposal originally was um, for H2A farm workers, they wanted to like pivot it and try to get it done another way. And then maybe then later add in the housing portion. So the project itself that like, you know, currently still lives is not even the one that they started with. Yeah, so all that being said, I think the project is just not what it was anymore. And I don't know if they had any more incentives to move forward. Um, I would be surprised at this point if they did try to I don't know, bring it back. H2A workers have the same protections as other workers when they come into the US. And so while they're working here in California, um, you know, there's a there's a way to, to, to make sure that they're being taken care of or that they're being treated correctly or paid correctly, whatever it is. Um, and it's not a secret that, you know, within like the farm working sector, the agriculture sector, there is a history of violations and, and not paying what should be paid and not treating farm workers the way that they should be paid. And so that structure already exists. And then when you add in the level of, okay, well now, those workers are a bit more isolated. Um, there's language barriers, there's cultural barriers. I think it's easier for the employer to, you know, just have control or not have to worry about farm workers organizing themselves and striking because they want something better. 
And that is a trend that, at least in our community, we continue to see, right? Farm workers have been organizing themselves and, and asking for dignified wages and conditions. And so, you know, it's an assumption. I feel pretty comfortable making that that's something that scares growers. When information like this comes out, people are so misinformed and make judgments and allow their biases to cloud the reality and don't take a second to just learn about what does it mean to be a farm worker? How do these individuals live? And at the end of the day, all of us are connected to farm workers. There's not a single, I mean, I'm concerned for you if you've never bought a vegetable or a fruit, right? Or flowers. If you are buying fruit, if you're buying a, a pack of strawberries, Take a second to think, where did these strawberries come from? What is the labor that went into it? What I can tell you is that pack of strawberries that you're paying four or five dollars for, someone got paid cents to pick up. These individuals are human beings. They have much more identities than just being a farm worker. Their parents, their husbands, they have so many other things to offer to our community and our community, our government, should be looking into embracing them and including them and not just seeing them as parts to bring in profit to a community. <laughs>